And uh, good afternoon. My name is Evan Weiner, and uh, thank you, Katie, for inviting me again. Um, the first time we did 1963, so sequentially we'll do 1964, and the next one, 65 and 66. Then we'll have some repeats after that, uh, because some of you have seen 67, 68, and 69. Um, we were supposed to do a whole bunch of uh, talks, but COVID got in the way. So anyway, let's talk about 1964. And 1964 is when the first of the baby boomers become adults. And I'm going to show you three very prominent baby boomers who became adults at the age of 18 in 1964. Donald Trump, George, H., uh, George W. Bush, and Bill Clinton all turned uh, 18 in 1964, all were born in 1946, hence baby boomers. Uh, in 1964, a whole bunch of things happened that impacted your lives. The Civil Rights Act of 1964, outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. It prohibited unequal application of voter registration requirements and racial segregation in schools, employment, and public accommodations. One thing it did not do, it did not give women equal educational opportunities in higher education, college, or universities. Uh, and that is Lyndon Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act into law in uh, January of 19, or rather July of 1964, behind him, Martin Luther King. And way behind them is John Lindsay, who is a congressman from New York, because of John Lindsay, I got on WNEW radio in 1978 at the age of 21. John Lindsay gave me an exclusive, told me he was running for Senate, state of New York in 1980. WNEW contacted me and for three and a half years I did work at WNEW radio with William B. Williams uh, on the AM and Scott Muni on the FM, but I was doing news, so I had nothing to do with any of that. Uh, on August 7th of 1964, the United States gets heavily involved in Vietnam. Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which authorized, authorized President Lyndon Johnson to take any measures he believed that were necessary to retaliate and to promote the maintenance of international peace and security in Southeast Asia. With that, the United States formally enters the Vietnam War 10 years after the French got out of Vietnam, which was going through a civil war. And there is Lyndon Johnson. During the summer, there were riots in New York and Harlem and Philadelphia and Chicago and Jersey City uh, and across the United States. And uh, here's a, a picture of a demonstration in probably a, uh, uh, right before the rioting started in Harlem, um, and that is Harlem back in 1964. Uh, and that is Rochester, New York in 1964, where a demonstration turned violent. The Beatles, they arrive at JFK Airport in Beatlemania starts in February of 1964, right here in New York, not very far from where you are in Great Neck, uh, over at JFK. Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, uh, takes on Sonny Liston and becomes the heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, Castro, Fidel Castro is now in his third year uh, or fourth year uh, in Cuba as the dictator of Cuba. Uh, and there is Nikita Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev uh, was the uh, head of the Soviet Union until October of 1964. It's with a chicken now. Uh, Cyprus independence from British rule in 1960. In 1964, there was a war between the Turkish Cypriots and the Greek Cypriots uh, and um, rival factions, paramilitary factions. And they break out into a war on the island. Uh, and there is a picture of uh, the troops in Cyprus. Uh, the World's Fair opened up in 1964. Some of you probably were there. I know I was there. I didn't sneak in. I went on the school trip, PS 151 in Woodside, Queens, and paid the other time I went there. But I know a lot of people have snuck in to the World's Fair by the Grand, by Grand Central Expressway. 
Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which ended segregation in public places, banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, national origin was the big story of 1964. And there is Martin Luther King getting one of the pens from Lyndon Johnson, who signed the act into law. And that looks like Jacob Javits, uh, the senator from New York behind Martin Luther King. What was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and why did it take so long following the Civil War, which ended in 1865? Well, following the Civil War, there were, there was a trio of constitutional amendments which abolished slavery, made the former slave citizens and gave all men, all men, not all, not everybody, all men, the right to vote regardless of race. Women couldn't vote in 1865. In fact, they couldn't vote in 1900. It would take them uh, until 1920 to get the right to vote for president of the United States. Uh, and here is, here are some of the people, characterizations of what was going on uh, in uh, the post-war, post-Civil War era, and people lining up for the right to vote. Many states used poll taxes literacy tests and other measures to keep their African-American citizens to franchise. They also enforced strict Jim uh, Crow laws, uh, which would be segregation, and condoned violence from uh, the white supremacist groups like the Ku Klux Klan. Essentially, yeah, you're free slaves, but you really don't have too many rights in the United States. Uh, and there is the poll tax. Um, the white men, they didn't have to pay a poll tax. African-American, they had to pay a poll tax to vote. The 1875 Civil Rights Act is notable. It was the last piece of legislation related to Reconstruction that was passed by Congress during the Reconstruction era. Uh, these included the Civil Rights Act of 1866, four Reconstruction Acts of 1867 and 1868, three Enforcement Acts, 1870 and 71, and three Constitutional Amendments between 1865 and 1870. That is Ulysses S. Grant. He was the president of the United States between 1869 and 1877. Uh, in 1877, there was a uh, presidential election. Uh, the candidates were Samuel Tilden, who's the Democratic candidate, and the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. Um, there were some things that were seen to be irregular with the 1876 presidential election. The Democrats agreed that they would allow Rutherford B. Hayes to become president of the United States if, if the Republicans said you could take federal troops out of the South and grant home rule to some states in the South, including South Carolina and Louisiana. President Hayes withdrew federal troops from Louisiana and South Carolina, and that is the major turning point in American political history. It ends the Reconstruction era and ushers in a system of Jim Crow, which meant African Americans could be citizens, but equal rights, you don't have them. And there is Rutherford B. Hayes, who became president on March 3rd, 1877. It was the Compromise of 1876, and it effectively ended the Reconstruction era. Southern Democrats did promise to protect civil and political rights of Blacks. They were not kept, and it was the end of federal interference in Southern affairs until the 1950s, and it led to widespread disenfranchisement of Black voters. Oh, if you had money, you could vote if you were Black. Uh, not long ago, not very, very long ago, citizens in some states had to pay a fee to vote in the national election. This fee was called a poll tax. On January 23rd, 1964, the United States ratified the 24th Amendment to the Constitution prohibiting any poll tax in elections for federal officials. In 1883, the United States Supreme Court really put the end to Reconstruction because it ruled in the civil rights cases, all those prior civil rights cases, that public accommodation sections of the Act of 1875 
were unconstitutional, saying Congress was not afforded control over per private persons or corporations under the Equal Protection Clause. So beginning in 1883, 17 years in the, or actually 18 years if you're technical, in the uh, 19th century, in 63 years in the 20th century, 63 years and 18 years, over 81 years. Um, yeah, blacks had rights, some, but they were not equal citizens. Like this, colored entrance only. If you go into an establishment, you have to use a separate entrance, absolute separate entrance. Oh yeah, water fountains? Well, hey, you were colored, you had to use a certain water fountain. White men, colored men, bathrooms over there, separate bathrooms, white women, colored women, that way, separate bathrooms, separate but equal. Uh, in the 1950s, there were protests in the South, led by people like uh, Rosa Parks in Montgomery, Alabama, who refused to give up her seat on the bus. The presence of segregation in the absence of democracy. Jim Crow must go. 1950s, Martin Luther King got involved in the civil rights movement. There was the Brown vs. Brown Board of Education, Brown vs. Board of Education of Topeka, 1954 Supreme Court case, in which the justices ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. But it kept going, kept going, kept going. That's Little Rock, Arkansas, 1957. September 4th, 1957, the first day of classes at Central High, Little Rock, Arkansas, the governor, Orville Faubus, called in the Arkansas National Guard to block the entry of black students into the high school. Later that month, the president of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower, sent in federal troops to escort what was known as the Little Rock Nine, nine students into the school and drew national attention to the civil rights movement. And there is Eisenhower talking about civil rights in the Oval Office. And that became, or what became of that was the 1957 Civil Rights Act. Uh, the protection of voting rights set out in the 15th Amendment of the United States Constitution. The Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice would be empowered uh, and they would empower federal prosecutors to obtain court injunctions against interference with the right to vote, and the Civil Rights Commission within the executive branch with the authority to investigate discriminatory conditions, like the Little Rock uh, High School, and recommend corrective measures. The purpose of that bill basically was to increase the number of registered Black voters to vote, since only 20% of the Black eligible voters in the Deep South uh, bothered to register to vote, and there were communities with even lower uh, registrations in the, deep, big south, in the Deep South. And there is Eisenhower signing another bill into law. And this one would include federal inspection of local voter registration polls by appointed referees to oversee Southern elections, ensure that African Americans were permitted to vote, penalties for anyone who obstructed someone's attempt to register to vote or vote. It extended the life of the Civil Rights Commission, which was previously limited to two years. The commission would oversee voter registration and practices and uh, prosecution for interfering with court orders regarding school desegregation, like in Little Rock, Arkansas. And that's what Eisenhower left behind, and it would be Kennedy who would pick up the flame, or would he? John Kennedy didn't do very much uh, in 1962 and 1961, first year being 1961 and 62, as far as the civil rights movement was concerned. But after watching what was going on in Birmingham, uh, in demonstrations in Birmingham, the first week of May in 1963, television cameras went to Birmingham, old Cronkite, old Iron Pants on CBS, Walter Cronkite, and Huntley Brinkley were in Birmingham to show you dogs going after protesters. The New York Times had a big picture of a dog attacking one of the protesters or demonstrators in Birmingham, also the first week of May on Sunday. 
On June 11th, Kennedy sought legislation giving all Americans the right to be served in facilities which are open to the public, hotels, restaurants, theaters, retail stores, and similar establishments, as well as greater protection for the right to vote, talked about it in the speech. Kennedy was moved to action following elevated racial tensions and wave of black riots in the spring of 1963 and seeing those images, whether it was in the New York Times or on TV, Cronkite, Huntley, Brinkley. And uh, Lyndon Johnson, after Kennedy was killed, Lyndon Johnson would deliver the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the Civil Rights Act, as I said, barred unequal application of voter registration requirements, outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, or national origin in hotels, motels, restaurants, theaters, and all other public accommodations, provided states and municipalities or prohibited states and municipalities from denying access to public facilities on the ground of race, color, religion, or national origin. There is something that's left out of there. It's called sex, women, women, left out of this. Uh, encouraged the segregation of public schools and authorized the U.S. Attorney General to file suits enforcing the act. Expanded the Civil Rights Commission established by the Civil Rights Act under Eisenhower in 1957. Prevented discrimination by government agencies that receive funding except for women, for women. Women went to colleges, or if they tried to go to colleges and were told they couldn't go, no big deal, they couldn't go. Women who were professors were denied tenure. They were asked, why can't I get tenure? Didn't have to be told. Women were still discriminated against despite the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And there were six provisions here. Title I, voting rights. Title II, public accommodations. Title III, desegregation of public facilities. Title IV, dis discrimination or desegregation, I'm sorry, dis desegregation of public facilities. Title III, Title IV, desegregation of public education. Title V, Commission on Civil Rights. Title VI, non-discrimination in federally assisted programs. It wouldn't be until 1972 that there would be a Title IX. Title IX gave women equal access to education, equal access to promotions in colleges. That would not come until eight years later. And there is Martin Luther King. He gets the Nobel Prize in 1964. Uh, in 1964, Martin Luther King said that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was nothing less than the second emancipation. The first one in 1893, 1863, rather, 1863, Abraham Lincoln. But just because there's a Civil Rights Act doesn't mean that the demonstrations and the protests in the street went away. They're still there. Uh, segregationists angered by the Civil Rights Act took to the streets and they attacked African-American demonstrators across the South. Jim Crow was still intact in the South and uh, there was no real change in the South after Johnson signs uh, the legislation into law. There are three guys who were killed. Uh, one of them, the guy on the right, was from um, up here, Pelham, New York. And uh, he is uh, honored at Pelham High School, which is about two, three miles from me. His name, Michael Schwerner. Uh, Michael Schwerner and Andrew Goodman, both white New Yorkers, traveled to the heavy segregated Mississippi in 1964 to help organize civil rights efforts on the behalf of four, the Congress of Racial Equality. There was a third man that joined them, uh, James Cheney, uh, and he was a local African American. On June the 21st, they disappeared. Their bodies were found on August 4th, 1964. On June 21st, 2005, on the 41st anniversary of the three men being murdered, an 80-year-old named Edgar Ray Killen was found guilty of three counts of manslaughter. For many, many years, the police never bothered to investigate the killing of these three people. Decades of police brutality kept off several instances or instances. In the summer of 1964, 
that led to a series of racially motivated riots in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and Jersey City. The United States wasn't the only place where racial segregation was taking place. This is South Africa. This is a beach in South Africa. And they're telling people on this particular beach, this is the white area only, or in the Dutch, the white area only. Please boycott apartheid in sport. 1964, there was an Olympic Games in Tokyo, and the International Olympic Committee decided that they were going to get involved in the apartheid movement in getting rid of apartheid in South Africa. On August 18th, 1964, South Africa was barred from the Olympics. South Africa was barred from taking part in the 18th Olympic Games, the Summer Games of 1964, in Tokyo because South Africa refused just to condemn the apartheid, just to condemn. Apartheid, of course, was, was basically where the limited, uh, where limited uh, white population ruled South Africa and ruled South Africa with an iron fist, and it led to separation. Blacks did not have the same rights, even though they were a majority in South Africa. The whites were the minority power wielders in South Africa. Meanwhile, Johnson is, Lyndon Johnson is signing legislation to expand the war or start the war in Vietnam. And there would be some minor demonstrations in 1964 about that. This happens in August of 1964. Why was the United States in Vietnam? Why should the United States care about Vietnam? Good question. The French got out of Vietnam in 1954. They couldn't deal with the French, with the Civil War between the Communist North and the South. During the 1950s, the Eisenhower administration took a look at what was going on there. And there was a Cold War going on between the United States and the Soviet Union. The problem here, North Vietnam, North Vietnam was communist. Ho Chi Minh was the leader of, of uh, North Vietnam, and there was a thing called the domino theory in the United States. And the theory was, if North Vietnam fell, if South Vietnam fell to communists, the rest of Southeast Asia would fall like dominoes. When John Kennedy took office in January of 1961, he vowed, South, Carol South Vietnam was never going to fall to communism. And there was Robert McNamara, who was the guy, the architect of the American, at least the early days, 1961 through 1968, Nixon comes in in 69, he was the architect of the United States blueprint. What are we going to do in South Vietnam? Not too much happened between 61 and 64. There were three Americans that were killed early in 1963. There were American advisors in South Vietnam, but the Gulf of Tonkin ramps up American involvement in South Vietnam. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution comes after two separate attacks on two Navy destroyers, the USS Mannix and the USS Turner Joy. They occurred on August 2nd and August 4th, the two destroyers were stationed uh, in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, in waters that separated uh, Vietnam from the Chinese uh, island of Hanan. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution authorized the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson, to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression by the communist government of North Vietnam. That is passed. August 7th, 1964, and that is the date that is generally accepted as the beginning of the Vietnam conflict, even though people were killed in 1963, and the United States had had advisors in South Vietnam for a very long time. According to the U.S. Navy, both the Maddox and the Turner Joy were reported being fired upon by North Vietnamese patrol boats, but later some doubts emerged about the second attack on the Turner Joy. Nevertheless, the attacks would lead, whether it happened or not on the turn of joy, would lead to an escalation of American involvement in the Vietnamese Civil War. And there is Lyndon Johnson who had signed uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. 
And this changes the United States because people begin to realize they may be called up to go to a war and they know nothing about South Vietnam, nothing about Vietnam, and nothing about Southeast Asia. In January 1965, 5,400 men were called up for the draft. By December of that year, there would be 45,000 men that are called. The monthly draft call rose from the beginning of the year, which was 17,000 to 35,000 a month. Young people began looking at this and said, hey, we're not going. It's not our war to fight. And they begin engaging in civil disobedience, which means that they're protesting. Um, the war is beginning to ratchet up. There is Nikita Khrushchev, and there is his uh, 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 there is his successor, Leonard Brezhnev. They are in uh, Moscow looking over something. Khrushchev had become a problem in the Soviet Union. Uh, Khrushchev was looking at some sort of detente with the West, uh, and uh, China uh, was not too happy about it either. Uh, China was communist, and they didn't think that Khrushchev's brand of communism was true to the course or, or true to the goal. And uh, some of the Soviet Politburo members were looking at it the same way. Uh, so back in the USSR, October 15th, 1964, the premier, Nikita Khrushchev, was removed from his office, replaced by Leonard Brezhnev. Uh, there is Khrushchev in Kennedy in 1962. They have a face-off. You might remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, Khrushchev was going to send missiles to Castro, 90 miles away from Key West is Cuba, and the United States starts to get worried about uh, missiles being in Cuba, and that led to the October 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. Khrushchev deployed nuclear uh, missiles in the newly communist Cuba, and that was within easy striking distance of American population centers. The population centers included Miami, which was uh, right down the road from Cuba, of course, uh, along with the capability of getting uh, as far north as Washington, D.C., and that uh, caused a major problem in Washington. John Kennedy in 1961 had authorized a takeover of Cuba uh, with the failed Bay of Pigs invasion. Uh, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis in the aftermath as part of the agreement with Castro, uh, with uh, Khrushchev, he publicly consented not to attack Fidel Castro or Cuba. Uh, Kennedy also privately agreed to take American nuclear weapons out of Turkey, and the Soviets were going to do the same in Cuba. Uh, and there is uh, Nikita Khrushchev in happier days with Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong became extremely critical of what was going on in the Soviet Union. Mao Zedong, of course, the leader of communist China or red China at the time. And uh, he's getting more and more upset with Nikita Khrushchev and Khrushchev getting more upset with Mao Zedong. They started calling each other names, the two countries, in 1960. Khrushchev said Mao was a left revisionist who failed to comprehend modern warfare. Meanwhile, Mao Zedong criticized Khrushchev as a psalm singing buffoon who underestimated the nature of Western imperialism. Uh, and there is Nikita Khrushchev reading a paper after being kicked out as the leader of the Soviet Union. The break with China, 1960s, and food shortages in the USSR eroded Khrushchev's legitimacy in the eyes of other high-ranking Soviet officials who were already bothered by what, he, what they saw as his erratic tendency to undercut their authority and his fascination with the West. Brezhnev would take over, and uh, Brezhnev would try to change the course from what Khrushchev was doing. He said, the Soviet people see their intentional duty, international duty, and the support of just struggle of the peoples against imperialism, colonialism in Africa, Asia, neo-colonism, also in Africa, for their social and national liberation, for peace, democracy, national independence, and socialism. What he said was, quote, we are coming out for an end to the arm race, for general and complete disarmament, for relieving the peoples from the mounting burden of military expenditures. Ho Chi Minh is the head of Vietnam, been there for a long time. 
since World War II. Uh, and he is looking for an ally, whether it's Brezhnev, whether it's Mao Zedong. And November 17th, 1964, the Cold War heats up again. The Soviet Politburo decided to increase support to North Vietnam. This aid included all kinds of warfare toys, aircraft, radar, artillery, air defense systems, small arms, ammunition, food, medical supplies. In a sense, the North Vietnamese were fighting a proxy war on behalf of the Soviet Union against the Americans. Here's some of the equipment. Uh, in, uh, meanwhile, over in uh, Cyprus, fighting between ethnic Turks and Greeks in the disputed, disputed island of Cyprus, leave 16 people dead. The two main ethnic groups started a confrontation with each other in 1963. 1964, in March, the United Nations sent 7,000 strong peacekeeping force to Cyprus. Lyndon Johnson gets involved on June 5th, and he moves to head off further inflammation of the Cyprus crisis. And he tells Turkey, no rash military moves for your own good. And there are some of uh, the troops uh, in the Cyprus problem. On August 10th, 1964, the United Nations brokered another ceasefire in Cyprus, diffusing the growing crisis between the Greek and Turkish Cypriots, heading off the threat of an invasion by Turkey. The conflict would not end. It would go on for years and years and years. That is Nelson Mandela in 1964. On June 12th, we were supposed to see the end of Nelson Mandela. We were never supposed to see him again because he received a life sentence for committing sabotage against South Africa's apartheid government, avoiding a possible death sentence. You know these guys pretty well. There is Paul, there is George, there is John, there is Ringo. It's the first group where everybody in the group is known by their first name. They are the Beatles. They come over to the United States on February 7th, 1964. And two days later, they're on the Ed Sullivan Show. And 73 million Americans gather around the television sets to see old Stoneface and the Beatles. There was no crime, no reports of crime in New York City between 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock on February 9th, 1964, during the evening. It was the biggest television crowd to that point to ever watch a TV show. And there's old Ed with Ringo, George, John, and Paul. The Beatles had conquered America. That's Bob Lipsight. You might remember Bob Lipsight from his TV shows on PBS. You might remember him from his columns uh, with the New York Times. Bob and I go back a long, long time. He's living out. Uh, in Suffolk County now, occasionally does uh, library talks. But in February of 1964, he was a sports writer with the New York Times, and he was covering the New York Yankees. And one day he gets a call from his editor saying, something going on in Angelo Dundee's gym. The Beatles and Cassius Clay are supposed to meet one another. Why don't you go down and cover it? The rest of this is Bob Lipsight. As he said, worlds collide on February 18th, 1964. The pop world with the Beatles and Cassius Clay, Muhammad X or Muhammad Ali, and they meet and the worlds collide. There is Sonny Liston, heavyweight champion of the world at that time. Now, what happens when Lipsight sees the Beatles meet Ali might have been a footnote to history. The Beatles could have been an overnight success and enjoyed no success after that. Muhammad Ali could have lost to Sonny Liston. We might never have heard again from Muhammad Ali or Cassius Clay. But the stars all align here. Everything is in place and the worlds collide. Muhammad Ali and the Beatles meet. Now Muhammad Ali had no idea who the Beatles were. Lipside told me that John Lennon, John Lennon was not an Ali fan. He was a Liston fan. And he supported Sonny Liston in this fight because, as he said, we don't associate with losers. Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, is a loser. 
Lipsight was locked into a room with the four Beatles for about a half hour. He said, he told me that Paul McCartney was fine, Ringo Starr was fine, George Harrison was fine, but Lennon, John Lennon was complaining. Why are we in this room? Why are we locked in here? Who's this guy that we're going to meet? We're not his fans. He's not the guy. Sonny Liston's the guy. And this is going on for a half hour. Yet, yet, the Beatles are let out of the room along with the guy. Muhammad Ali walks into the room. And, uh, and, and here. Hello? We had something happening. Let me just uh, mute everybody here. So for me. Okay. Uh, so Muhammad Ali walks into the room. And the first thing he says as he walks into the room is, who are those four little sissies? And we know that Lennon didn't particularly like Muhammad Ali. So at this point, we got these five guys. They walk into the room. The lights go on. The red light goes on the camera. And it's showbiz. You got pictures like this. You got Ringo Starr on the back of Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. Officially, he didn't change his name by this point. Uh, so you have Ringo Starr on his back in the youth of the world have new heroes, the Beatles and Cassius Clay. The old guard is kicked out. But what if Cassius Clay loses to Sonny Liston? What if the Beatles are just overnight sensations and gone? Again, it would just be a footnote to history. Well, it wasn't a footnote to history. Ali would win. He'd beat Sonny Liston. He would become the heavyweight champion. He would refuse to go into the army. He would refuse to... Um, he would not go into the U.S. Army because he did not think that the Vietnam War was a just war. He had nothing against them in Vietnam. The Beatles, on the other hand, the Beatles became a worldwide phenomenon, selling out Shea Stadium in 1965, producing albums that were classics in 1966 and 67 in 1969. That's me with Ali in 1985. And uh, by that point, 60,000 shots to the head, uh, along with Parkinson's syndrome, and he couldn't speak anymore. Uh, but he became beloved, absolutely beloved, after not being serving in Vietnam uh, in the 1970s, became beloved 1980s, and uh, was given a honor at the 1996 Atlanta Olympics. He lit the flame. Uh, and there's uh, Ali, a little better shape, uh, three years earlier. That's me uh, with the microphone in my hand, uh, looking at Ali, asking a question, actually. And uh, the other microphone belonged to Bob Trainer. Uh, Ali could still speak in 1982. Angelo Dundee had the gym where Cassius Clay or Muhammad X or Muhammad Ali trained for his fight with Sonny Liston in 1964. It was the Fifth Street gym. Angelo would eventually replace that gym. That's uh, Angelo and my son in 1995. And uh, Angelo telling me stories about the Beatles meeting Ali. And he said, my, my guy, my champ. He said, really didn't know who the Beatles were. Uh, Muhammad Ali was a character who was not looked favorably after he won the championship of the world. Uh, he basically teamed up or he basically began to read Elijah Muhammad's readings and uh, teamed up with the national uh, with the nation of Islam and uh, one of the guys who was supposed to be his mentors what or his mentor was Muhammad uh, was rather Malcolm X um, Malcolm Little who joined the uh, na nation of Islam and uh, they became very close uh, in 1963 and 1964. On March the 6th, the Nation of Islam leader, Elijah Muhammad, announced that the new heavyweight champion of the world would no longer be known as Cassius Clay. He said, this Clay name has no meaning. Muhammad Ali is what I will give him as long as he believes in Allah and follows me. Um, Malcolm X would break from Elijah Muhammad. Ali would eventually break from the Nation of Islam and uh, Elijah Muhammad. Many newspapers refused to call Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali. The New York Times editor, A. Rosenthal, was emphatic about it being Cassius Clay until he changed his name in a court of law. That came from Robert Lipside, who did not like A. Rosenthal very much. 
Ali never changed his name legally, but under 1960s laws, he was never required to do so. He just said one day, I'm Muhammad Ali. A. Rosenthal's New York Times, September 18th, 1970. About uh, Georgia, state of Georgia. State will grant Clay Ring license. Six years later, the New York Times, the old gray lady, is still calling Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay. The Beatles, meanwhile, they did something rather interesting in the South right after Lyndon Johnson uh, signs the Civil Rights Act. The Beatles are supposed to play at the Gator Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida. It'd be the only time that they were supposed to play in Florida. And uh, WAPE Radio, the Big Eight, was sponsoring the concert. And it was touch and go whether or not the Beatles were going to play this concert on September 11th, 1964. Uh, they said they were willing to cancel this concert. Why? Because they learned that the audience was to be racially segregated. Five days before the show, the Beatles put out a joint statement. We will not appear unless Negroes are allowed to sit anywhere in the stadium. Their reasoning was some of our heroes, Little Richard, who they got to know in Hamburg, uh, among others, Fats Domino, were their heroes. They liked them. They said, hey, they couldn't sit and watch us either. So either the show is desegregated or we are not going to play. They ended up playing. Now, when Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band came out in 1967, uh, they put celebrities on the cover. And one of the celebrities they put on the cover uh, to the left on your screen in the boxing robe was Sonny Liston. John Lennon never deserted Sonny Liston. He suggested Sonny Liston be on the cover. And there is the uh, cutout that, uh, for the cover of Sonny Liston. Sonny Liston did eventually see the Beatles, but was not very impressed with it. He would eventually die of a heroin overdose. Meanwhile, John Lennon, John Lennon has an interesting history with Muhammad Ali. In 1972, he begins to write a song called, I'm the Greatest. Muhammad Ali, used to call himself, I'm the greatest. And he had a registered trademark called GOAT, greatest of all time. Lennon did not sing the song, I'm the greatest. Ringo Starr for his 1973 album sung, I'm the greatest. The line came from Muhammad Ali. In uh, 1977 at the inaugural, the 1977 inaugural, January 20th, 1977 of Jimmy Carter, Muhammad Ali and John Lennon and Yoko Ono were invited to inauguration parties. And here is John Lennon spending some time with Muhammad Ali at Jimmy Carter's inaugural ball in 1977. How many of you were at the World's Fair? Probably a great number of you. How many of you snuck into the World's Fair? It's a good question. Because whenever I give this talk, there's always somebody said, yeah, I stuck into the World's Fair. And I would say, how'd you sneak in? He said, well, the Grand Central Parkway. There was a little hill that led to a fence that was unguarded. There was a garbage can there. We jumped on the garbage can, can hopped the fence, and got in. Me and all my buddies. Maybe that's why they lost money. This is a couple of years ago at the World's Fair. And unfortunately, very few artifacts remain from the 1964 World's Fair that you could visibly see unless you go into the Queen's Museum. The Unisphere is one of those artifacts that remains from the 1964 World's Fair. Uh, the 1964 World's Fair was notable because it was not officially designated by the people who designate World's Fairs as an official World's Fair. It wasn't supposed to be. The next World's Fair that was officially designated was in Montreal in 1967. 1962, there was the Seattle World's Fair. But Robert Moses, and of course you probably know Robert Moses, Robert Moses didn't really care about the World's Fair Commission. He was more interested in promoting whatever Robert Moses was doing, and he was promoting this, his baby, the World's Fair with Shea Stadium opening up right next to it. Shea Stadium, that plot of land was originally intended in Robert Moses' mind 
for the Brooklyn Dodgers, even though Walter O'Malley wanted to stay in Brooklyn and picked out his spot uh, by the train station, or actually all the train yards in, in Brooklyn. Uh, the World's Fair, peace through understanding. 650 acres of land, pavilions, public spaces, displays from exhibitors from around the world, countries, cities, corporations. Corporations played a big role in this World's Fair. In fact, it was the first corporate World's Fair ever taking place, and private groups all set up shop to display their ideas and accomplishments, and they got 50 million view uh, visitors. Um, but Robert Moses said, we're going to get 70 million, and that caused some financial problems. Maybe if they would have watched that fence by the Grand Central Expressway where people hopped over, they might have had a few more visitors. Uh, there is um, Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson um, walking down that avenue that leads now to uh, where the United States Tennis Center is, um, the opening of the World's Fair. There's Lyndon Johnson. By the end of the first season, the first session, the fair was on the verge of bankruptcy. And they sold tickets for 1965 to help pay down the debt from 1964. They had financial troubles, but somehow they managed to last through the 1965 run. Uh, this is the New York State Pavilion, one of the uh, artifacts that remains. Not in very good shape. There is money supposedly going into this to restore the uh, New York State uh, Pavilion, to fix the elevators, to get a view from the top of, uh, of those two towers on the left side, which were featured in the movie in the 1980s, Men in Black. I'm not exactly sure why you would want to go to the top of uh, those two structures, because I don't know, what do you want? A view of the Long Island Expressway or a view of the Grand Central Parkway? I mean, which one do you want? Uh, the GCP or the LIE? Because that's basically what you're going to see. And uh, that was a picture taken actually with my zoom lens from the other side of the LIE. But there were some things that came out of the New York World's Fair. Because Walt Disney used the New York World's Fair sort of as his laboratory for what was he wanted to come in Florida and take some of the stuff that was in the New York World's Fair that he thought worked and take him out to California. And one of them was this robotic Abraham Lincoln, uh, which was part of a uh, pavilion at the New York State World's Fair. And it worked. It worked. It brought Abe Lincoln to life. And when he, Walt Disney decided at that point, he was going to bring all the presidents to life through Lyndon Johnson in this big display. He got that done. Uh, it was a small world, or it's a small world, was also created at the World's Fair in 1964. And um, Walt Disney was the guy who actually looked at this attraction and designed this attraction uh, in the support of the United Nations Children's Fund or UNICEF. Uh, it's a Small World was a huge attraction, absolute huge attraction for two years at the fair. Uh, after the fair shut down, it was packed up, shipped to Disneyland where it opened on May 28th, 1966. There is a It's a Small World down in Florida as well. My daughter, who is two years old, two and a half years old, absolutely hated. Uh, it's a small world down in Disney World uh, when she was there in 1986. So Disney got uh, Mr. Lincoln. He got It's a Small World. And he was looking over some of the aspects of the World's Fair, see how we could improve them, see how we could take it out to Disneyland and eventually Disney World. And he did so. Uh, and this is Alaska. That is Anchorage, Alaska. I was in Anchorage, Alaska last in 2006. There was the great earthquake uh, in 1964 on uh, Easter weekend. Uh, it was at 5.36 in the evening, Alaska Standard Time, which meant it was about uh, 10.30 at night uh, in New York. Uh, the ground shook for more than four minutes. It launched several deadly tsunamis. It triggered killer landslides. It was the biggest earthquake in US history. And if you go up to Alaska, and, and I caught a cruise uh, in 2006, because I was speaking on the cruise, and uh, you took the train down from Anchorage down to uh, 
Whittier in Alaska, which is uh, old World War II uh, Air Force Base that is always uh, in, sm in fog, uh, which is why the Air Force went there in the 1940s. And they handed it over to uh, the cruise ships um, when cruising opened uh, in Alaska in the 1990s. Um, but if you take that train, you could still see devastation from 56 years ago. Meanwhile, um, who killed John F. Kennedy? Who killed him? Well, the government really wanted to know who killed John F. Kennedy, and they had the, uh, the Supreme Court Justice, uh, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court at the time, Earl Warren, uh, to head up a committee to take a look at what happened in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, assassinating John Kennedy. Who did it? Well, on September 24th, the Warren Commission report was given to President Lyndon Johnson. And then on September 27th, 1964, it was released to the public. Uh, some of the people who were on that commission included Gerald Ford, who was a congressman from Michigan, who would ultimately become president of the United States in 1974. Uh, a young uh, senator from the state of Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter, uh, was also on that committee. And the committee concluded with all the evidence that they had, all the best evidence that they had, that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone with an unknown motive in assassinating President Kennedy, and that Jack Ruby, Jack Rubenstein, the Dallas strip club owner who somehow had complete and unfeathered access to the Dallas Police Department, Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, acted alone uh, in his murder of the suspect, Lee Harvey Oswald. Many, 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 many conspiracy theories have come out of this since 1963. Uh, far less now because uh, this happened 57 years ago. But people doubted the report. They didn't think it was possible that the three bullets did as much damage as they did. And they thought there were other gunmen uh, sitting on the grassy knoll um, who shot at the car. Uh, but the Warren Commission is the official government report on the assassination of President Kennedy and also Lee Harvey Oswald, and they came to the conclusion that Oswald was the lone gunman in the Texas uh, School Book Depository building. And I was at that building, and it, it is not a very far shot. It's only about 200 feet that Oswald had to shoot from where he was on the sixth floor to where the car was going. And uh, you look at the pictures and they look a lot, that there's a lot of space. But if you actually go to the museum, there's not a lot of space. Barry Goldwater was the Republican who was running for president against Lyndon Johnson. Um, Johnson had the Great Society. He was going to make healthcare available for seniors. Uh, voting, uh, a number of welfare programs that were going to become available. Uh, and uh, Barry Goldwater did not like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and he was very critical of it. And Goldwater also seemed to suggest that uh, if he's elected president, he would not be above using nuclear weapons on both Cuba and North Vietnam to achieve United States objectives. Barry Goldwater was painted as this crazy guy who was ready to drop nuclear bombs, which ended up with the daisy chain commercial with this little girl and her daisy uh, flower, picking the flower and Barry Goldwater blowing up the world. Johnson would defeat Barry Goldwater with 60% of the popular vote. Johnson turned back the conservative senator from Arizona to get his first full term in office after he took over from John Kennedy in November of 1963, after Kennedy was killed on November 22nd. As I said, Martin Luther King won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he was 35 years old at the time. He was the youngest person ever to receive that award. And he gets it for basically this, nonviolent resistance to rach racial prejudice in the prejudice in the United States. Also that year, Sidney Poitier gets an Oscar. On April 13, 1964, Sidney Poitier 
became the first black performer in a leading role to win an Academy Award for his performance in Lilies of the Field. It was also the year that um, the Surgeon General said that smoking is bad for your health. Now, some of you might have watched the 1970s, 1980s weekly soap opera called Dallas, and that's Linda Gray, and I've done this in person, um, and asked people who that model was, and that's Linda Gray, who is uh, J.R. Uh, Ewing's wife, um, Larry Hagman's wife in the show, and she's pitching the Terrytown, uh, Terryton cigarettes. Now, you couldn't get away with this commercial today because this woman had a black eye because somebody would have said, what kind of abuse did you suffer? Uh, but in 1964, us Terrytown smokers, Terrytown smokers would rather fight than switch. Join the unswitchables, get the filter cigarette with a taste worth fighting for. And she has the black eyes to prove that she is a Terrytown smoker. On January 11th, 1964, Luther L. Terry, who is the Surgeon General of the United States, released a report on the, which was called the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health. And it had three things, a cause of lung cancer and a larger gill uh, cancer in men, uh, Lanterns, a probable cause of lung cancer in women, the most important cause of chronic, uh, chronic bronchitis, 1964. And we leave with the TV show, the TV show called That Was the Week That Was. It was on NBC, January 10th to 1964, the May 4th, 1965. And I remember the theme song, That Was the Week That Was, It's Over, Let It Go. And my wife is sitting to me and said, you were seven years old. How could you remember that show? And I said, I remember that show. It was comedy, it was satire. And I forced her to sit and watch YouTube showings of the show, whatever is left of the United States showings that's up on YouTube. And some of the people that were on the show, well, David Frost. David Frost was on the show not only in the United States. He would fly over from England to do the United States show. And back, he was also part of the BBC show. Nancy Ames, the woman in this uh, picture, she was the TW3 girl. She was the singer. Uh, the acerbic comic Henry Morgan on the show, a 29-year-old Woody Allen before he became the movie writer and producer, Steve Allen. Alan Sherman, hello, mother, hello, father, here I am at Camp Granada. Buck Henry, uh, who uh, was Mel Brooks' partner on Get Smart, uh, Buck Henry. Uh, Dick Knoll, Elliot Reed, the songs of um, Tom Lerner. Uh, Pat England, Phyllis Newman, Bob Dishy, Mort Saul, Mort Saul. Uh, if you uh, know anything about him, a not a satirist uh, who uh, actually had his own ticker tape machine in his house so he could read it to keep writing uh, whatever uh, bits that he was doing. Jerry Damon was the announcer. That was the week that was. Uh, in England, the show came over from England, uh, two of the writers would become the founders of the Monty Python group. That was uh, Graham Chapman and John Cleese. The BBC version of the show received many complaints. Lord Aldenton, who was the vice chairman of the Conservative Party, wrote to the BBC director general, Hugh Green, that David Frost had a hatred of the prime minister, Harold Wilson at that time, which he finds impossible to control. And they also hit on something else, something else that now is kind of talked about in some commercials on TV for some lawyers. The program attracted attention and complaints from the English Boy Scout Association because they did an item questioning the sexuality of its founder, Lloyd Baden Pell. Um, this was suggested that there was some sexual abuse in England of Boy Scouts. And we have found out subsequently, many years later, it did take place. 
That was the week that was. It's over. Let it go. Ooh, what a week that was. That's the week that was. And this is the talk that was. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie, for bringing me here. Oh, before we go, did any of you have that kind of hairstyle? Some models had that kind of hairstyle um, back in the day. 1964 featured the start of the Vietnam War, the civil rights struggles in the United States, major part of 1964. Beatlemania, Muhammad Ali, civil war in Cyprus, and the change in the USSR. The New York World's Fair opened. The first baby boomers turned 18. There were changers uh, going through the world, events that impacted people that we still feel in the year 2020 and so on. That was the week that was, that was the year that was. It's over, let it go. Thank you so much for uh, being there. Thank you, Katie, for inviting me. Thank you to the people who may watch uh, this uh, little program that uh, I did. Uh, when you can see it at your own leisure, um, when it's up uh, on the uh, internet, and I want to thank everybody. And if anybody has any questions, I am going to right now uh, allow you to, um, if I ever can find it here, there we go. Um, you can actually speak. So does anybody in the room have any questions or any comments before we go? But I think somebody has to unmute you or Anybody in the room that has anything to add? Because I don't know if, let me see if I can unmute you. No, I can't. Well, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's see. Okay, if not, thank you so much for being a lovely audience. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Uh, this will be up on YouTube. I'm going to send it to Katie, and uh, you'll be able to see it. So thank you, Katie. Feel better. And thank you, uh, everybody in the room. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Uh, my next talk, I guess, when we schedule it, will be 1965, which was a year that a lot of stuff took place. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you.